Hello, I'm Emma Green and welcome to the Virtual Engineering Centre podcast, Engineering in Digital. Liverpool is home to hundreds of creatives and innovators, bringing them together for the creation of new art, improved accessibility and simply easier ways of working. With theatres such as the Everyman, Empire, Royal Court and the Playhouse, Liverpool attracts thousands of visitors each year to a number of exciting and highly entertaining shows, attracting big names in industry as well as showcasing hundreds of local talents, creators and artists. Theatres and shows have been running for thousands of years and today showcase a mix of traditional and new ways of operating, bringing old and new stories to a variety of audiences. Today I'm joined by Peter Greggs, the Vexperion Digital Projects Engineer and theatre enthusiast with a diverse background across the creative industry. So welcome Peter and thanks for joining me. Hey Emma, nice to be here. Uh, so to kickstart, um, it would be great if you could give, give us a small introduction to yourself and your background and how you came about to join us here at the VEC. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my background is in sort of like film and new media or content creation. Um, and I started working for the Ever and the Playhouse Theatres in 2016 uh, in their marketing team. Um, I was just running campaigns, uh, but had like a focus on how we could use social media and digital content and create content in house. You know, it seems crazy to think back in 2016, that seemed like quite a big thing for an organisation for a theatre to be doing. Some people were doing it really well and some people were just weren't using that those tools at all and would just focus on traditional market methods so i come in with that sort of remit to 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 help the theaters um create more digital content and then when the theaters locked down in uh, 2020 um, and we couldn't produce work in the way that we always had done uh, my focus shifted to how we could continue to engage audiences but in different ways and in ways that we hadn't done before. So we made things like online um, education tools. We created a podcast that was it had you know user generated content in. Uh, we were looking at how we could create work in in the space and stream it to audiences when people couldn't gather together. And then in 2021, I became the organisation's first digital producer. So I built a content and distribution strategy and that was, you know, that looked at how we could tell stories differently or share stories differently, how we could make audiences times at the theatre better and how what the organisation could adopt technology to work in a better way. And that's actually how I met the VEC through, through doing that. And we, uh, the Everyman and the VEC had begun to explore how digital technologies could be used to improve accessibility of live work. Um, and then I ended up joining the VEC uh, last year in 2022. Um, and I've been continuing to look at how, you know, new technologies or digital adoption in the creative sector could influence how they work or influence the work that they make. Fab. Um, so do you, did you see much of a change when you started to use like social media um in your role um, and just how audiences reacted to it, for example? Yeah, yeah, I think that the, I think that the organisation saw a big change in how audiences interacted with the business, with, you know, yeah. and how, how they went from, you know, sort of like hearing about something to buying a ticket. And yeah. it had to happen, it happened at a time when actually local media, things like local radio or local newspapers began to decline in readership or, you know, in people buy, you know, like um, like the Daily Post stopped, stopped getting delivered yeah, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And that is what theatres did rely on, you know, that local yeah. journalism uh, to get the word out and it had to shift. Um, and I think we did see an increase in people interacting with the organization on digital platforms and in turn um, being excited to visit and, and come and see something and I joined that really exciting time when we changed sort of how we were making work you know we 
introduced the Everyman Company, where we had a company of actors that would stay with us for six months and, and be in five different or four different shows. Um, and that opened up an opportunity to tell a different story. It wasn't just about yeah. selling the work. It was about telling the story of the organisation making work in a different way. Yeah. Um, and that, that presented that exciting opportunity to use digital technology, you know, to use digital content to tell that story. Yeah. Um, so if you'd say that theatres and performers were already kind of starting to move towards digital in that sense, um, would you agree that COVID really accelerated the adoption rate? Absolutely. I think across the whole sector, everyone turned to using digital technologies. You couldn't congregate in the way that we had done for thousands yeah. of years, you know. <laughs> bringing people together and having a shared experience. So actually, how do you continue to tell stories in a world where you can't do it in the way that you always had done? Yeah. And I think people who had been opposed to technology before really just quickly shifted their turned right around and went, oh God, how do we use it now? Yeah, how now the choice we... is removed. You've got to adapt. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and act. I, I mean, maybe I'm looking at it with rose-tinted glasses, <laughs> but I felt like that time people were really excited to think, oh, how could we do things differently? Yes, you it know, is an opportunity. Yeah, I work with people who are like, oh, tell me what we can do here. How can we do that? I've had an idea. How can that fit in with the tools that we've got? Yeah. Um, and I mean, like, to be fair, it was under very stressful circumstances. Yeah. You know, it, the world was very chaotic, but it, gave everyone that opportunity of let's continue to be creative let's think a bit differently you know and, and I think I think people did enjoy doing that in a creative industry as well exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah um so having worked within the creative and performing arts sector for so many years how do you see the sector changing long term and then what do you believe are the key barriers that you could f foresee yeah well the sector now has to compete not only with other creative organisations or companies in their area or their city, but like with the entertainment sector as a whole. Yeah. Audiences' attitudes have changed. It's no longer, should I go and see this show or should I go and see that show? It's, should I go to see a theatre show or should I just watch something on Netflix? You know? Yeah. Um, that is what people are up against now. So the arena that organisations are now competing in is huge. Uh, but they are beginning to adapt their distribution efforts to continue to engage in audiences and go to where audiences are. You know, you've got the likes of Soho Theatre who are putting their comedies onto Amazon Prime or National Theatre. You know, they've got National Theatre Live that are streaming into cinemas or National Theatre at Home, which is their on-demand streaming service. Uh, even a, even the likes of regional theatres like Bristol Vic are, are putting their shows onto Sky Arts for, for viewers to watch. Um, but it is expensive and it's not necessarily the capture that's expensive. That That is a big chunk of money. But you've also got to think about the percentage of the fees uh, that go back to the creatives. Yeah. So smaller organisations are reluctant uh, to online distribution because the payback is quite small yeah 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 um but i personally feel like the more people that do it the better the content that the better the content gets the more places you put it in the payoff gets greater so you almost just need people to be brave and persevere as well absolutely yeah it's um yeah it's interesting isn't it because then it's offering those audiences greater accessibility but convenience as well of if they haven't got time after work to go to a show or travel somewhere, maybe they're a bit more remote to, in, com in comparison to the theatre, for mm. example. Yeah, it's, it's greater convenience. Absolutely. I mean, like a good point for that. And that, that, uh, this is why I would always champion online distribution. It's never uh, you either do it in person or you do it online. You know, you people need to start thinking about this as like a cohesive product. Yeah. You do it in person. And then it can also live online. 
and yeah. and I actually feel like one of the biggest benefits is for people who are parents and carers. You know, the the way theatre exists at the moment, where it's like, oh, you've got to come for a show at seven thirty. That just doesn't work for some people. So you've yeah. given them an option to go, you can watch this anytime you want. And actually you can watch 20 minutes and then you can pause it and then you can go and do the school run. Yeah. Or then you can come back and then you can watch 10 minutes and then you can do this and that and the other. You know, actually it's given people that freedom to um, engage with your art and your entertainment, you know, like in, in, a, in, in a completely different way that suits them. Yeah. And suppose as well with it being online, the shows perhaps might have greater um, longevity where the, you know, it's not, this show's going to be played in July and then it's going to stop and then next show comes in. It's kind of like if it's on an online platform, it could be there for a much longer period of time for people to log on or download and save, watch, like you said, at their convenience. Absolutely. I think that makes some artists nervous because yeah. they, they like the <laughs> idea of having something that exists for a week and never people never see it again you know <laughs> they can um, shut the door on it yeah. and move on to next show yeah. next creative idea it, absolutely but i think that um i think you've got to think about it from a sustainability point of view as well yeah you're investing so much money and so much time and so much resource into making something if it lives longer than six weeks which you know most regional theatre shows run like for like six weeks or so if it lives for longer than that then there is a benefit to all of that money all of that time all of that resources yeah you're right there's a longevity to it yeah um so you mentioned that there, there was like a reluctance maybe um across some of the artists um, for example, having it recorded, um, reducing the longevity. Um, would there be any other resiliences or maybe um, concerns that artists and audiences might have with the idea of certain elements of shows going digital? I think sometimes with artists, it's about headspace and really getting your head around something new and how it can impact your work. So you see people do things how they've always done it because that's easier. You know, a lot of the time you're just like, I've done this before. It's copy and paste. Let's do it again. And I think sometimes if you're just given a bit of room and given a bit of headspace, you can be innovative. Um, plenty of artists are using technology and digital in new ways. But you do see some who are reluctant. And I think it's also like a financial thing. It is expensive to try new things. Using technology or accessing tech is expensive. So when you see schemes like the Creative Clusters program, which has got, you know, Future Screens Northern Ireland or Story Futures or XR Stories that are funding artists to think differently and putting them in the room with the right people, whether that be industry leaders or academics, that's where we start to see innovation truly being explored without fear. So once you joined the VEC, what was your understanding of digital and how did you see the potential? I think one of the really exciting things when I joined the VEC was seeing how other industries were using technology to improve how they worked. And because the arts is the world where I come from, my mind was constantly like, oh you could do this with that or you could do that with that um so that was really useful to see but also being able to have those conversations with our engineers to fully understand how things work and you know being like you know how does the internet of things work what can it do what are the capabilities of that how does unity or unreal work and how can we push it to the way that we want it to just understanding the world of tech and and the technology more has been really really helpful i suppose as well um quite a lot of industries will see other industries and sectors and even maybe even competitors using technology in a certain way and then i think maybe a lot of the time businesses might not have thought it in the first instance when maybe they've 
learnt about AI, but then when they see how other companies are using it, it can start to generate ideas and get the ball rolling. And then you actually think, well, actually, yeah, we can do that. Um, and then it improves your understanding. I think a lot of sectors work in silos as well, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they do their thing over there and we do our thing over there. And actually... There's a lot of crossover. Yeah, so much crossover and a lot of learning to take away from each other as well. Yeah, because a team is a team regardless. They've all got different functionalities regardless of end product and service. Um, there's still those functionalities and cross. Yeah, you said crossovers. So, yeah, there's a lot of different ways I think people can learn from it. Totally. Um, so the VEC recently worked alongside FACT as part of um, an LCR4 holistic project and co-hosted a creative arts digital sand pit event. Um, here we were joined by a number of local theatres, performers, artists, and those interested in how we can take advantage of digital tools for a variety of uses and improving how we operate within the industry. Um, so these were split into four sections, including creative innovation, audience enhancements, operations management, and business opportunities. Um, so first of all, most think of the VEC and even digital as like headsets and VR as a starting point. So how are these technologies being used or can be used by creatives and does it really add um, or provide any additional value? Um, well, I actually think the really exciting thing with VR at the moment is the announcement of Apple's Vision Pro because Apple have this habit of making tech really accessible and sort of like, you know, home ready, he says in inverted commas. So I think with the launch of that, we're going to see a huge spike in people using VR and audiences wanting immersive experiences. And I think the art sector really needs to be ready for that because they've been making immersive experiences for years. So how do we shuffle sideways and do that in a digital environment? You know, VR can be used to collaborate and connect people across the world and attend the same digital space. And what you do in that space is up to you. But I think about the possibilities of people all over the world being in the same room, and that is really exciting. I think, personally, I've always been quite sceptical of VR, but when, when we did that, um, project with Wired Aero Theatre as part of the LCR Holistic program. Yeah, I think I really got it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you could see it for yourself how yeah. it can help. I really did, you know, and I, I watched it, and I still felt it. You know, I still got that same experience of how I felt when I watched it live. Yeah, and I think about, and, and I think using it on the on the right art is the important part you know being led by your art and never trying to just keyhole tech into something yeah have your idea first and then exploit the possibilities of the tech that's the right way of doing it um so just for listeners what was the support with um wide aerial theater yeah so wide aerial theater are a bungee dance company who create shows and tour them all across the UK and actually internationally as well, pre-COVID. Yeah. And they were worried post-COVID around how they would continue to tour their work in international settings because the landscape had changed. Um, so we worked with them to explore 360 video and, ha and how you could use that to capture their work and distribute it through a VR headset. Um, and we've created a, like an immersive experience that audiences could watch through a VR headset. And it was from the, the audience's point of view. So you were taken into this space, you sat down and then you could just watch the show as it just happened around you. Um, so I know as well that Wide Aerial Theatre also looking um, into using this technology, um, one for yeah, people to almost take part in their shows in a virtual environment. Um, but also for kind of like training because they were saying at the event how they have um, 
a show in Europe where they have opera singers that are taken up into like hot air balloons, basically lifted uh, quite high <laughs> from the ground and then are expected to like um, sing and be vocally um, coherent, which some of them might not be if they're afraid of height. And so it was a really exciting way to almost train people to not be afraid of the heights or to get used to it before actually getting up there. Um, so that's quite an interesting use of VR as well for performers beyond just the audience. It's like for them to help them adapt into a new environment before they're physically there. Yeah, absolutely. So when we were helping them with that experience of creating this sort of like immersive environment, um, we also um, introduced them to 360 mounted cameras as well yeah. and put them on some of the performers at the same time so that they could begin to see what that actually looked like from a performer's point of view. And I mean, like, some of these performers are, like, up and down, you know, all <laughs> over the place, right? You know, so you can imagine someone that is new to that, like, being quite scared of it. Yeah. Um, so we did, we introduced them to, to those head-mounted cameras as well. And I think what it helped with Wired Aerial Theatre was create almost like a pathway for what they want to do next you know it you can't just go from zero to 100 and expect people to you know know everything about digital technology yeah, yeah you know yeah. actually you introduce sort of an an immersive experience for audiences and then you look at how head mounted cameras on performers work and then you look at how that is then used for training purposes and then how that footage can then be used in an educational setting for when they take it to, you know, schools to do workshops. You know, yeah. it's all about a stepping stone for you start here, you start in small and actually where can you go um, when you when you are learning about this technology. And I think I think they're looking at how they use that footage to um you know, teach kids in during workshops what the performers actually go through. Um, yeah, you know, like you using it on an iPad. Respect it a lot more. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, all. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's all about that stepping stone about how, how you get there. Brilliant. So another popular point for digital is data. Um, feels like you cannot enter a conversation about digital without talking about data. So regardless of what type of data you're referring to. Um, so how do you think data is changing the creative sector and what types of data are we really concerned with here? Yeah, well, I think data's been a massive buzzword in the sector. You know, the collection of uh, data for reporting is really, really important, especially for subsidised arts. But I think what we're talking about here is, uh, in terms of data, is the collection of information and how we use that internally to help processes. Um, so an example of that is how we worked with the Everman and Playhouse during the Holistic program to look at uh, RFD tags um, and how they could be used to create an online system of all their props and costumes or sets. And like they split across multiple sites. So having an online log to see where things are stored, if it's been checked out, you know, is someone else using it, is it damaged? You know, this you have things you know from years ago. You know, so actually, it could become a really useful tool for them. But when you have that data, when you have collected that data, it allows others to access that data as well. You know, it doesn't just become an internal resource; it is an external resource as well. So you could start sharing that with other organisations across the city, across the UK, across the world, and begin sharing your resources and cutting down on waste and, you know, being able to, like, recycle things for new uses. Yeah. Um, I know that we worked um, with one local theatre in particular who, as you mentioned, the RFD tags, uh, which is radio frequency identification. Um, and I know they were really interested in using those tags for costumes and props. Um, so, you know, the theatres have hundreds and hundreds of these items that are kind of stored and shared and try to log as accurately as possible. But yeah. I bet there's a lot of moving parts, quite literally. 
Um, so I think it's really interesting how they could use these tags for better tracking, booking, mm -hmm. repurposing. And then there was even another um, organization that was then wanting to scan their costumes so then they could like create a much better informed um, but also much more realistic brochure of all their props and yeah. assets and then you can actually see the exact type of colour it is rather than just like a black and white photo that's 2D you can't really see it yeah. but it's a 3D you can really explore it see the shape size how it maybe fit in your, um, your theatre shows yeah absolutely well I think the 3D scanning is just the next iteration of taking a photo or a video <laughs> exactly, you know yeah. so I think actually the sooner you start you know using you know iPads and that have LiDAR scanners on now so yeah actually now that we start to uh the sooner we start to 3D scan things I think this is going to become a more useful thing for us to have in the future yeah not only can it you know um as you're scanning it give you like a I think it's I don't know how accurate it is a semi-accurate measurement <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say you know to save you start you know taking measurements or something you could just 3d scan it and it gives you all the measurements yeah exactly. actually there's tools out there where you can place 3d scans into your space and and you know see if it fits um which I know is one of the biggest issues of of like working in theater actually so something is made for one space does it fit in another space yeah so actually i think that is a really useful tool to be using as well yeah and even with ar you can then say if it was a prop in particular you could even use ar to then place that scanned item in your area to see exactly how it would look yeah. um, i know a lot of companies now are using like apple for example use it for if you're buying a new phone you can see exactly how big it is and you can like virtually hold it just by putting your hand out and yeah. um, you can see how big it is and how it would fit in your hand and how easy it is to use before buying yeah and there's an element of like 3d scanning that also means that you could potentially in future 3d print it you know if yeah. you lose it if yeah. it gets broken if it gets lost if it's something that you just need time and time again actually if you have a 3d model of it you can you can just go and and, and print it somewhere you know it's a bit cheaper yeah um also with regards to the um data mapping mm -hmm. um i found that really interesting um with regards to using a lot of the data from previous shows and um theaters history of theaters to create and develop a much more accurate and historic view of liverpool and the the creative sector within the city centre, uh, well, within the city region, but then also you could obviously expand that to nationally and globally and have a much bigger understanding of how the sector is changing or has changed through a very accurate timeline. Yeah, I think what would be really interesting, and there are tools out there that people are using, you know, in subsidised arts, this is a massive thing, collecting data, sharing data, analysing, you know, industry uh, trends. Um, is there even maybe on a local platform, you know, within the city region, a, a tool that we can make where people input data and we can see really quickly the impact that the art is having on the city? You know, where are the trends? What are people, what are people doing? Where are people going? What is the financial impact of the arts in the in in the city? So, um, I think it, you you need to carry on thinking about how data can be used really cleverly to, yeah. to, to help grow your business. Definitely. Um, and I know we've also said like data is very closely linked to sensor technology and that's obviously a form of how we collate this data and collect it, um, whether it's lighting or temperatures. And then this information obviously once fed back can help us to see how theatres and companies can reduce waste and um, energy waste, reduce costs and bills and things like that. But then also in other areas that they could further invest um, to get a greater return on investment. Um, so the heart of every show and piece of art is surely the audience um, and how we can connect to one another through said work, tell a story um, and talk to a range of audiences as well. So how do you think um, digital is keeping the audience at the heart of performances and artwork. 
yeah, I, I mean, like, the audience is still key and always will be. Art creates a beautiful environment of everyone having the same shared experience. Everyone in that moment is equal and you were all watching the same thing. You will interpret it differently, but that is the beauty of it. Um, you know, I've been in loads of places where I've absolutely loved something or absolutely hated something, and the common theme is you turn around to someone that's next to you and go, what did you think of that? You know? Yeah. And that will yeah. always be key. Um, but I think changing or improving the way audiences can experience art or engage with art, you know, how do audiences interact with exhibitions differently? Are they more interactive? Do they influence the art? Is the audience going to actually make the art and your job as a creator is to give them the tools to do that? You know, can people have more personalised experiences? Do audiences, you know, choose how a story ends? You know, how can we give audiences interactive tools in the space to feel part of the art? Um, so what tools or digital um, technologies do you think are helping audiences to become more engaged um, and immersed within the show, um, but also maybe those who have accessibility or um, like certain health concerns? Um, are there any tools and technologies that are helping those to overcome those barriers? Yeah, I think it actually, and this is something that I'm really passionate about as well, is how digital technology can help, especially live events with accessibility. So we've been working with the Royal Court, uh, Chataway and 20 Stories High to look at how we can create a system that could caption a show live. So through using voice recognition and uploading scripts to create an output of an accurate transcription of what is happening live on stage and i mean this is the beginning of the explorations you know the possibilities this are huge your outputs could be text so they could be captions but if you're tracking a show and and where you're up to in a show your outputs could be audio for audio description they could be video for bsl interpretation you just need to get the fundamentals of following a live script done, following a live show, and you could output anything. So the possibilities of creating an accessibility tool and creating, you know, almost a new standard for what accessibility is in live uh, theatre, in live events. The, the, the tools are there. You just need the funding or the right resources or the right people in the room to actually develop it to make it you know right for the people that need to use it yeah um and i know the likes of royal court and local sme chatterway for example are looking at how to uh, bring in auto captioning um, and language translation opportunities and um, so that technology for basically making sure that those that are like hard of hearing for mm. example um have much better access to the live performance so they're not missing out on having to have somebody sit next to them to transcribe it for them mm -hmm. um, it's done digitally in real time as well so there's no like lag time or anything like that mm -hmm. um, which is yeah brilliant for inclusivity and then allowing even more people to experience the beauty of live theatre and mm -hmm. live performance um, so now we've all seen Avatar um, and the new film that came out um, earlier this year so how can avatars or metahumans be brought into storytelling and um, do you think this is another technology that we'll start, to, we'll start to see a lot more often? Yeah, I think so. You know, the technology is becoming a lot more like hands-on, you know, the, the interfaces and the tools to create this is becoming a lot more accessible so people can get their hands on it a, a lot easier. Um, and I think it is a really useful tool, especially for like people in um, museums or galleries or exhibition spaces to create a, a, you know, an entity to sort of tell a story, to take people through an exhibition, to you know, move them around the space. Um, and I know we created the Mary C. Cole um, avatar, which is really exciting. Um, 
and actually, you know, I was speaking to David about that, who, who's a, an engineer here, and he was talking about how AI can be plugged into an avatar. So actually, the possibilities of asking, um, you know, a historical character anything about their life. You know, you you could re you could use AI to to really exploit that, but with limitations because <laughs> there always has to be limitations. <laughs> There's to, always limitations. Doing because AI could just run wild. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, I know you said about like maybe C coal um mm -hmm. as the example, but yeah, I think it's really exciting the idea of bringing a performer back to yeah. do a show. Yeah. Um, it might be a bit surreal at first, um, but yeah, I mean, imagine going to the Royal Theatre or the Empire and having Shakespeare stand in front and retell, I mean, how many times Shakespeare has been performed, but yeah. like actually having <laughs> him there yeah. um, would be pretty cool. It is cool, isn't it? And, it, you know, even like Abba Voyage, you know, like <laughs> down in London, I mean, that is really cool. And and because <laughs> I went down to see that and I, you know, in my head was like, it won't look real, you know. Yeah, you, you, you're yeah. gonna have something in your head that says they're not really there, but it genuinely. After a while, how they you, do, forget you forget it's not them. Yeah, and you are like, oh wow, this is actually really cool. So, you know, the possibilities of of using avatars in in, in your work it is actually really exciting. You know, what can you do with that? Yeah, um, yeah, 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 absolutely. I know it's really closely linked to like um, holograms and then we've seen mm. in the past, was it like gorillas or somebody used oh, um, yeah. holograms in the past as well? Um, and other, other like artists and singers, for example, can bring yeah, past artists back to do like a duet with somebody who's mm. passed, um, which then creates like another iconic um, performance. Um, or even just somebody who can't be in two places at the same time yeah. <laughs> and the audiences still feel like they've seen so-and-so play with so-and-so um, which is yeah pretty cool again. I mean you, you see you're seeing it at the moment where actually um, film are using sort of 5G networks to film in two separate locations rather than moving crews all to the one place yeah actually from a st sustainability point of view if you have someone you know um in england and then someone in scotland who are who are you know two teams and they're doing the same scene well actually yeah. how can that be explored for live work you know is there a world in which you know something is being filmed up here and performed live up 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 in scotland and then in wales yeah. you've got the same but actually, you're sort of streaming them and merging them together to create a piece of work, you know. Yeah. So you've yeah, got yeah. two loads of audiences experiencing something quite unique. That's cool. I've also seen um, the Mandalorian, the like Star Wars, where they use like a green screen, but a digital green screen that then is um, the performers um, act in front of it, yeah. and that changes. So they don't have to, like you say, necessarily go to these physical places. They can kind of film it in front of it because it's so realistic looking yeah. with the like quality of the, sh uh, the screen and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so although bums on seats is obviously very important and valuable um, to be able to continue delivering um, monetary gains and profitability are obviously at the heart of every business. So how can digital support in the generation of new incomes and bringing in new money? Yeah, I think it's really important to remember that this is where the world is heading. You know, you can't run away from it. This isn't going away. So organisations need to continue to think how they will use tech, how they will be represented in tech spaces and digital spaces so that they continue to remain relevant. Because if they just ignore it, we'll get to a point when people won't engage with them because they're not in the spaces where people actually are. So when I was planning digital works at the Everyone and Play House, I used to ask myself a few questions. I used to ask, do we anticipate there to be a demand for in-person tickets? Does the product have a wider appeal beyond the Liverpool city region? And then, like, are we proud of the content of this experience and want more people to engage? Does it make sense to open up the profile of this event by offering it online? 
will change and the price point and open and up accessibility help to engage more people and that those questions always resulted in these two final questions will those that can't attend the theatre in person engage digitally or will those that won't attend the theatre in person engage digitally those are the questions that you always have to ask yourself because if if the answer to some of them is no i actually don't think that people will engage digitally then then don't put your time and resources into it yeah. but if it is yes you know it really need to start focusing on that space um think about how tech can support your organization if you become more inclusive and accessible you open up new audience opportunities can hosting things online open up opportunities with people who can't get to you take that boundary away and can you deliver things for cheaper and therefore more people can enjoy it because you know you don't have the cost of hiring a space for example think about it in real terms how can this actually benefit your organization ask yourself those questions definitely um and then another kind of <laughs> topical um conversation around is nfts the yeah. non-fungible tokens yeah. um so obviously we've seen that um come about in the entertainment especially the sports industry with people collecting like it's basically like collecting digital football stickers and Token, football cards yeah, yeah. and nfl and things like that um so how could they how could that kind of be introduced within to the performing arts and creative sectors and, and are there any businesses that you might know about that are already doing something I mean, I find the whole concept of bizarre. NFT <laughs> so bizarre, but you used to collect cards when you were a kid, so it's yeah. just the next version of it. You know, if it like, generates uh, money, then yeah. it makes sense. It's another potential income, isn't it, for businesses, whether it makes sense at first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or not. Yeah, you know, actually. There is a market. There is a market. That's actually where like 3D scanning things could come in really handy, because even if you're just 3D scanning it for your you know online log at the moment doesn't mean that you can't use that 3d scan in 10 years time when yeah. you know you've got the dress that the next jodie coma wore you know like it's I mean, she had some amazing outfits yeah. <laughs> in that show so you know and then you can sell nfts of like that yeah. 3d scan um there are organizations doing it i think we worked with y entertainment for a while didn't we about yes um, how they were using NFTs um, and how they would, you know, create exclusive pieces um, and, and, and sell them as, as like a new, a new sort of like revenue, a new sort of income. Um, so I think we've covered data, <laughs> accessibility, we've covered quite a lot. Um, so what would be your closing advice to those listening who work in the creative and arts industry? Yeah. I think build connections with people who have the knowledge, collaborate with new people, don't feel like you need to have all the answers yourself, start welcoming new people into the room um, and learning from them and actually pushing people who are outside of the sector to think and problem solve creatively is your skill. Our engineers absolutely loved working with creative organisations because it made them work and think differently and approach problems differently. So be excited, be inspired, think of possibilities that can open up for you. And this isn't to replace you or your art. These are new tools to create differently. For any of our listeners who are interested in finding out more about how we can support your business and exploring the opportunities of digital, 
please visit www.virtualengineeringcentre.com or drop us a line at vec at live.ac.uk. We also have a brochure and video from this exact event showcasing some of the live case studies and collaborations from businesses across the supply chain and demonstrating the ways in which these technologies are already being implemented and used within businesses, large and small. Thanks again to all of our listeners and remember to join us next time on the VEC Engineering in Digital podcast.